Hello, friends. This is Doug Reeves broadcasting from Boston. I'm joined by Leslie Burden in Louisiana. We're going to start in about three minutes. But before we do so, I want to request that you use the question function on your GoToWebinar uh, and let us know that the video and the audio is OK. You can use the question or the chat function. I'll monitor that. And that way, we know that the technology is working well before we start. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. It looks like we've got good video and good audio. Thank you very much for that. And you can use that question function throughout the webinar to uh, let us know uh, what your questions are. We'll start the broadcast in just two minutes. Hello, everybody. My name is Doug Reeves, broadcasting here from Boston. I'm joined by Leslie Burden, about whom I'll tell you more in a moment, from Louisiana. The topic today is supercharging your science instruction with high-impact literacy strategies. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest speaker before we get underway. And I just want to tell you throughout the broadcast, you're welcome to ask questions. You can use the question function on your internet, but you can also text me directly. I realize we have some people who are not using a computer but are simply on your telephone. And if that's the case for you, get ready, if, as long as you're not driving, to write down this number. And that number is 1-781-710-9633. That's 781-710-9633. If you're not on a computer and you only have a cell phone, you can still ask questions by texting to me directly, and I'll make sure that Ms. Burden gets those uh, questions. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our guest speaker first. Um, Ms. Leslie Burden is an award-winning National Board Certified Educator with over 25 years of experience, which includes both rural and urban settings. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Microbiology with a minor in Chemistry, as well as a Master of Arts with an emphasis in Science Education from the University of Texas. Ms. Burden advocates at the school, district, and state level to help write and implement standards and curriculum as a district lead science teacher and a state science teacher leader advisor for the Louisiana Department of Education. She has presented throughout the United States on various topics related to science inquiry and literacy, response to intervention, effective data analysis, professional learning communities, instructional coaching and mentoring, and school improvement for such organizations as the National Science Teachers Association. She has recently written a national uh, blog article for the Achieve the Core website called Welding Literacy into Scientific Instruction. 
Her greatest joy of education is to teach students to see the vitality in themselves. Uh, Dr. Burden, uh, Ms. Burden rather brings extraordinary background in education, and Leslie, we are so pleased to have you join us this afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking your time. I am so glad to be here, and I'm so glad that you are able to join our webinar today. So this is going to be a very interactive discussion about literacy connections in science. Please be, feel free to dialogue in the chat box at any time. We will stop and reflect during this webinar when you see reflect and stop. And at that time, we'll talk about any key points and questions. Your input is very welcome because we can learn together. So let's start talking about our objectives. We're going to connect literacy strategies with the three-dimensional learning, next generation science standards. We're going to reflect on the use of anchor text in science. We're going to develop an understanding about how a foundational reading activity is used for scaffolding. So let's first begin with the uh, central question, how does literacy connect to the next generation science standards? We know that there's a three-dimensional learning. The first dimensional is, pract is practices or science and engineering practices. This describes the behaviors that science engages there as they investigate and build models and theories about the, the natural world. And key sets of engineering practices that engineers use is they design models and systems. The National Research Council uses the term practice instead of the term skills to emphasize the engagement that occurs during an investigation. Because it's not just requiring of skills, but it's actually also the knowledge that is required. Although engineering design is, a, is similar to scientific inquiry, there are uh, distinct differences. When you're dealing with inquiry, you're looking at formulating a question that we can answer through investigation. But when you're dealing with engineering design, you're looking at form, formulating a problem that can be solved through design. For example, um, just working with my students uh, to, uh, yesterday, we were working with earthquakes. Earthquakes and looking at uh, the different types of waves that occur in earthquakes and where earthquakes happen, that would be the science investigation part. But if I'm looking at Japan and I'm looking at a city that is this pop uh, populated, how can I build a building that is earthquake resistant would be the engineering piece of that particular unit. Then we go into the cross cutting concepts. They can be applied across all the disciplines or domains of science. And in doing that, they link the different ones together. And then examples of them would be patterns, cause and effect, scale, proportions, systems, and system models, in, uh, energy and matter, structures, and stability and change. The framework emphasizes these concepts because they need to be explicitly taught to students. In other words, we really make sure that they are actually taught and we actually point them out as we're working through a particular unit with students. Then last but not least, it's just the knowledge base. This is the disciplinary core ideas. This is the power to focus in the curriculum and instruction and the assessments for students to understand that they understand the actual material that has been given to them. Now, for this particular piece, we're going to be looking at what students do. For literacy, where it's connected is where is it is in the actual practices. So that's where you have your science and engineering practices and what students do. That is where we're going to be connecting it for the three-dimensional learning for today. So that leads us back into the next slide. And as we look at the next slide, we're going to be looking now at anchor text. So if we look at how the use of anchor texts are connected to science and engineering practices, we're looking at the one, one, of, the dimensional, one of the dimensions of the three-dimensional learning. We got to make sure that when we look at anchor texts, they're going to be obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. And oh, we are developing how students can read uh, complex texts in science. They're also going to be working with them 
make sure they can read it, but also comprehend it independently and proficiently. And then last but not least, when we're looking at the reading anchor number 10, it says to read and comprehend complex literacy and informational text. This information actually comes from the Appendix M. Uh, it was a release from the uh, Next Generation Science Standards, May 2013, if you want to look at the full document. Now, how does this affect me as a teacher? As a teacher, I must study how complex texts are written, especially when we're looking at science, because science a lot of times is written one or more grade levels above the actual intended audience. For example, if I'm an eighth grade student, I may be looking at an article that's written really on a ninth or a tenth grade level. However, I have to scaffold the information because we have what are called um, concept loading that's found in a lot of textbooks. So I have to uh, I have to be able to anticipate the misconceptions that they may have when they're reading that may happen during the discussion. And then I must also know how to look at those text features so I can be able to model them in a think out loud and also be able to look for key vocabulary when they're doing this this scientific inquiry. This is important or essential because I have to gauge the difficulty so that the learning does not stop for the, the particular child or children that I'm trying to target. So that's going to lead us into in what ways does text complexity determine a chosen anchor text? We know that text complexity in the common core is three dimensional. First, you have what is called quantitative. Quantitative measurement is usually calculated by computer software, and it usually measures the word length, word frequency, sentence length, and text uh, cohesion. So let me kind of break that down for you. When we're looking at sentence length in science, there are a lot of complex sentences, compound complex sentences. You have a lot of word frequency because they're actually introducing a uh, tier three vocabulary that's not normally found in everyday society, or they're taking a word that's found in everyday society and applying it in a different way. For example, mass. Mass in everyday society is weight. But we know when we're talking about physics, mass and weight are different. When we're looking at mass, we're looking at how much space something takes up or the amount of inertia in the object, how much resistance it has to change. When we're looking at weight in physics, it is a mathematical formula, mass times gravitational pull or mass times G or mass times acceleration, force equals mass times acceleration. So when we're looking at a textbook, it's going to be shown in different ways. And so as a result of that, that's part of, of looking at some of the quantitative parts. That's why it's important. You can also uh, test the level of the uh, text that you're trying to introduce to your children by going to www.lexcel.com. You can actually type in a piece of the text and it will give you the Lexile level. Now, if you go to readingworks.org, they automatically tell you the, the Lexile level of the articles in which you are choosing. Then you have, uh, uh, we've done quality, uh, now I'm going to qualitative. Qualitative is best addressed when you're looking at the uh, needs of the uh, of the reader. It deals with the levels of meaning, which I kind of already alluded to when I did mass versus uh, weight, actual purpose. Why did the author read? Uh, why did the author write this? So let me go back. When we're dealing with the levels of meaning, you're talking about literacy text, okay? Which in for us that's science fiction. And I always try to bring in a science fiction anchor text, which I kind of would talk about later on during this webinar. Then you have purpose, which is your informational text, text structure, language clarity, and then actually the knowledge demands. Because we're talking about concepts, abstract concepts that may not actually be found in everyday society, everyday experience, we experience what is called concept load when you're looking at science and engineering. 
when I was looking at them and actually going through and looking at the patterns and trends of the writing, I realized that a lot of the complex texts were heavy. So let me explain what I mean by concept loading. Concept loading is where you have several relationships and images within a paragraph or a section. When that happens, the author tends to be very, uh, tends to be very explicit by giving graphs, diagrams, charts, and tables to describe what was written in the text. If I, as a teacher, don't explicitly teach how to how to look at graphs, charts, and diagrams, students tend to miss some of the key ideas, especially if they're English as second language students or they're struggling readers. This is where your academic vocabulary is emphasized using context clues, uh, using context clues like cause and effect, direct definition. So this is where my ELA uh, counterparts how to help me to understand how to teach those concept, uh, those context clues to my students. And in addition, they have to also apply these and think like a scientist. So in working with this, this leads us into our reading and our reader and, ta and tasks, which is our last piece. And you notice on the triangle, it's kind of at the bottom, like the, it's, uh, it's kind of like the foundational piece. It holds up the other two. So when, this, when you're looking at this measurement, it's focusing on the individual reader and the task and purpose for the reading. So by using a student's motivation, and a lot of times in science for the three-dimensional learning, you have what is called phenomenon. You have anchor phenomenon, you have secondary phenomenon. So now I want you to, when we talk about phenomenon, is that, uh, for example, if I'm bringing in atoms, I may actually show a video on, um, or I'm talking about, I'm sorry, let's change that. If I'm talking about chemical reactions. I may actually bring in the blowing up of the Hindenburg and showing the, uh, they used hydrogen instead of helium to hold up the balloon and you had the flammability that happened and the whole thing caught on fire and a lot of people lost their lives. If they were looking at earthquake and we looked at the earthquake yesterday, I showed a video, a 20 second video of the building shaking. Why would the building shake during an earthquake and that would, that's our phenomenon, and that's what we're building on for the rest of the unit. So that's going to tie in what type of anchor text I use to get the, using the student's motivation, knowledge, and experience. Uh, the complexity of the task. So I remember when we're looking at the different uh, types of reading, we have to make sure that we talk about what type of text features or visual features are there and also the academic vocabulary. And then last but not least, my professional judgment. I have to be able to determine how appropriate the task is. And another thing about science, science and literacy are really based on parallel or reciprocal processes. So let me explain what I mean by that. Both scientists and readers, writers and communicators have to activate background knowledge. Me as a scientist, I have to make sure I have background knowledge to fully understand what text I'm looking at. I also have to observe the text. I have to ask questions. I have to search for information. Um, I have to note details. I have to do comparing and contrast. I have to sequence events. I have to distinguish between fact and opinion. And I have to make inferences and predictions. Last but not least, I have to link cause and effect which that's where you talk, come in with your context clues. And I have to use language. So I have to use the academic or domain specific language to communicate the findings. Readers also do that when they're reading. So we actually are going into the science and engineering practices when we teach good reading habits to our students in the science classroom. So that leads us into the next one. So when I get ready to look at anchor text, one of the first things I do is unpack the standard that I want to address. I'm using this one because this is the one I'm currently working with with students. So it tells me I have to, they have to be able to demonstrate an understanding. This is their performance task. When we get into, have gotten through the unit, this is what they have to be able to do. Construct a explanation based on evidence for how geoscience 
processes have changed the Earth's surface at various times and spatial scales. So the example I'm going to use is the rock cycle. So if we look through this, it gives an emphasis on tech, uh, tectonic plates, continental drift, where it says slow plate movement. It also talks about the uplift on large mountain ranges. So we're starting talking about divergent, convergent, and um, divergent, convergent, and transform faults. Then it talks about small, which is the rapid land uh, slides or even microscopic geological reactions. Then it talks about how many geological uh, processes happen, such as earthquakes, volcanoes, and meteor impacts. So when I'm looking at these particular things, I know I need to bring in the rock cycle because it is something that actually uh, shapes the local geological features. And it's something they need to know about before we can actually go into some of these other uh, uh, key concepts. So I found that anchor text can create a sense of purpose and direction for a unit. And the, the way it does that is that it promotes connection. So we started off with rock cycles. I'm gonna actually show you uh, the different anchor texts that I use for that. And right now we're working in, we've done uh, continental drift and seafloor spreading. And so toward this, you'll see some of the uh, bit, uh, some of the vocabulary posters I use to um, guide the thinking with the connections there as well. And right now we're going into earthquakes. And so they're gonna do a cold read when I get back. And then we're gonna look at the different questions. And as they read, they will generate some questions that they want to be answered by the text or by additional research that they're gonna do when they get into their jigsaw groups, which I'm gonna kind of talk about how that, how we're doing anchor text will actually generate more of the scientific inquiry that we're talking about um, when it comes to the actual reading for research. Now, when I'm aligning or promoting concepts between the, the disciplinary core ideas, which is uh, dimension one, and dimension three, when I'm talking about science and engineering practices, when I'm aligning in such an explicit way, so students are better able to grasp what's being taught and what they are to learn. Another advantage of having anchor text is that it bridges the gaps for struggling readers by aiding with comprehension difficulties. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that because that deals with the foundational reading activity that I'm gonna kind of bring out in the uh, webinar toward the end. When I realized the benefits, I did experience some difficulties in locating text. So I had to determine what components were important. So when I got ready to start looking for text, um, Science News is one that's actually created for middle school students and high school students. So I started to, doing this webinar, kind of give you some resources that I kind of use to help me find those anchor texts that were important. Yes, you can still use the science textbook, but what I found out is that I want my students to annotate, which I kind of would talk about the importance of annotation as well. So I would actually um, enlarge the text that I want them to use and actually make copies where they can write on the, on the uh, text themselves and then place them inside the interactive notebooks. So in planning, I found that identifying both expository informational and literacy text based on the type of thinking I needed them to process. So we go back and we look at this particular um, standard, it says to construct. So what do they mean by construct? If you go through the whole document toward the bottom of the document, they kind of tell you exactly what they want the students to do. So they want them to be able to uh, analyze and evaluate how geological practices change the surface. So that's the type of thinking on type of anchor text I would want them to be able to do. So I'm starting off with them looking at the rock cycle first. So now my emphasis now is gonna be reader, reader and text component when we look at text complexity. So I know I've covered a lot of information in those, those slides, so we're gonna stop and reflect right now. I'm going to actually uh, ask are there any challenges or 
takeaways that you've gotten from the, the first couple of slides and are there any questions you have? So, uh, so uh, Ms. Burden, there are some questions. Um, let me begin with this one. It says, you mentioned Lexile text. Uh, what's a good level to start with uh, students? Um, and it says, I have uh, students that are on average two to three grades below grade level um, where they should be. I uh, remember when we're talking about Common Core, we want to make sure that we're introducing the uh, actual text level of the uh, of the article. But there are ways that you can scaffold students to understand the text, even though it is a couple of grade levels above them. And one of the things I, I've used in the past is thinking out loud and peer reading, such as reciprocal teaching, which I'm kind of going to talk about in the webinar. So you want to make sure that, remember that standardized test, they're going to be at a certain next tile for the articles they're going to read for performance tasks. So you have to scaffold the development of the student, think about the level of difficulty and scaffold it to the level of the text. So one of the things is to think out loud and just modeling the text for them. Sometimes I even do read out loud groups. You do core reading. You can do the peer, pair, uh, pair, pair reading. And sometimes even um, I break up the article in chunks. So one, one group reads one paragraph, another group reads another paragraph, and then actually uh, talk about what they have gotten from it in the article in the jigsaw. So they become experts. So a lot of times, if, the, if you feel that the article is too difficult to read as a whole, there are some strategies you can use to break it down. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, are there resources you recommend uh, for anchor texts? Yes, there are a lot of them out there. One is called Read, uh, Reads uh, Reworks.org. Another one that's out there is Science News. You actually type in Science News, it, it will come up, and it has a lot of good uh, articles. Um, the uh, Time for Kids is also a very good one. National Geographic also has some very good resources for informational text and some literacy text based, or some science fiction based on uh, science concepts. And the last question before we go on is that you made several references to uh, the similarity between the demands of the ELA requirements and science requirements. Have you had experience in joint activities that include both ELA and science? Yes, I have. I had the pleasure of working with uh, ELA teachers, and one of the things we came up with was the impact of science through in, uh, invention, people, and uh, invention, people, and literacy or text. One piece of it, if we look at the invention part, that's going to be a, just a typical science fair project where they're actually just doing the, uh, doing different products and actually just presented. Then the other piece that we did was people. People was the science fiction text where they actually had to write a report. And the ELA looked at the technical piece of it. And I looked at the content and knowledge piece. And then they developed a, um, a display board to actually talk about their research findings in a form. So yes, I, and then that was our end product, but throughout the year, the ELA and science, we actually worked together. Um, the, I've always talked to the ELA about key things that she's doing in her classroom. For example, how she organizes her essays. She used the four square model. So I designed a lab report with the four square model. So it's very important to have those collaborative discussions with your ELA and then eventually we also brought in social studies. So we end up, every, all of us end up using key literacy strategies that were, uh, that were aligned. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's talk about our quote. It says the engineer, uh, the inquiry approach to informational science text helps students to question, be critical about text rather than to always defer to the text or use text simply for finding answers. Also, um, 
the way this works too is that as they are reading through it, they are actually coming up with answers and questions on their own. So I'm going to actually show you that piece where you put that in, that inquiry or questioning in uh, the classroom when it comes to content uh, complex text. So let's close it out uh, for informational. It helps them to read like a scientist because again, as we look at a informational text, they have to compare and contrast. They have to um, read for details. They have to ask questions. So, and then it also builds up their vocabulary. And it does that through explicit, for teachers, they explicitly teach about the direct definition clues and cause and effect of inferences. And then it helps them to come up to apply the high level thinking questions as they're reading through the text to actually discern the purpose of what the author is trying to tell them. So let's look at an example. This is an example that I used when we're looking at um, the rock cycle. If you notice on this particular one, it says it has the use of analogies, which is compare and contrast, which is like the skin of a balloon. Um, you have the direct definition context loop by using the word called. And believe it or not, if you don't actually explicitly teach this, students don't realize that that, that is a clue to the definition. So at the beginning of the year, I actually would pull something like this. And we actually just walk through the different types of text and visual features that the, that the textbook shows. And we actually work with them showing them the different types of compare and contrast and inference context clues that may be found in that textbook. It really, really helps because as the year progresses, they're able to point them out for themselves because you've explicitly modeled it several times throughout the year. So at the bottom, if you notice, you'll see the uh, ignorance rock or ignorance has been bolded. Stop, pay attention. That's how I tell them. And it kind of jerks them into attention to let them know that when we're looking at text features, they are extremely important to the author. Why did they, why did they include that in the actual um, text? And I start, I will kind of emphasize that toward the end of this webinar, but that is one of the reasons why we want to make sure we have an informational text and we pull it out of the textbook and let them actually uh, have a written dialogue with the with the text through annotation notes. Now that's going to take us into the uh, science fiction piece. I always try to make sure that I have a, uh, the informational is the primary anchor text. I know it's not always taught like that because that comes from an ELA perspective, but we're talking about a science perspective now. So when I'm talking, when I do a key concept, in this case was rock cycle, I include a, a primary anchor text. In that case, it's informational because we're trying to build the background knowledge or scientific background knowledge of the reader. Then I also bring in a science fiction piece of it. For example, if I'm talking about genetics, I bring in Jurassic Park and I show that little film clip of uh, the uh, DNA molecule being combined with the dinosaur and frog. And then we bring, I bring in a piece of that novel. We don't read the whole novel, but we read specific pieces so they can see that the science fiction concept. So how does that help? Well, the, it makes them make connections of the text organization and structure because they, there's a different text organization and structure when we're talking about a literature text compared to expository or in informational text. It also helps them to make a real connection with the scientific concept that you're talking about. Uh, it helps them to analyze an abstract concept. For example, we can't see DNA, but by bringing in the film strip where they actually see the little uh, cartoon and actually talking about Jurassic Park and how DNA was spliced for them to be uh, created, gives them a, con uh, a concrete example so it also helps, and then last but not least, it also helps to bring those 
interconnections between other disciplines that we need so much. So it helps to bring in that ELA and sometimes historical connections. Do you, can you always find one that brings in both? No, but when you can, you, you really got a diamond in the rough. So let's kind of talk about color. So we are talking about rock cycles. So we talk, talked about the informational text being my primary anchor. Now I'm bringing in another little piece. This is called the Adventures of Color Kyle Site. If you type it in as Adventures of Color Kyle Site, it'll come up. Um, it is part of an old unit where they actually talk about uh, Carla is a um, is the main character. She's been given a human identity, such as a name. So we got personification going on. So we have the ELA connection. As we go through the article itself, her last name is actually mineral found in rocks. So I can actually bring back up that mineral that rocks or a conglomeration of minerals, or it's made up of minerals. Then she also goes through the rock process. So what I have students do, and this particular, uh, uh, this particular activity also comes with pictures from a cartoon. So I ask, what, I, what I ask them to do is actually identify uh, the process of the rock cycle. She is in part of a She's in an actual marble statue. So that brings from ancient Rome. So that brings in the historical connection of us talking about rocks being in society and being used in art. And they being have been here for many years. What are some of the uses of rocks in our society? So that kind of brings in a re some real life connections and also brings in some historical uh, significance. Then toward the end of this, remember they have to construct an explanation. So now I'm working on constructing an explanation at first dealing with the rock cycle. So they have to compare um, the information and literature text to create their own cartoon. Because remember, this was a, a cartoon activity. So they're going to take a, the illustration and actually connect it to the rock cycle. So they, they create their own cartoon and story about the rock cycle. So they have their own explanation of what the rock cycle does. They have to use key vocabulary to do it. So in planning, one of the things you want to make sure of is thinking about the reader and task consideration is always go back to what the uh, standard is asking students to do. So are there any questions or comments on what has been for this particular part of the uh, webinar. So let's see what we've got here. Um, so one of the recurring questions, Ms. Burden, is that uh, there's a lot of different content that you've addressed from chemical processes to physics, to plate tectonics, to the rock cycle. And a lot of teachers are struggling with the fact that if they've got students below grade level on reading, how do I allocate my time um, when I need to spend more time on literacy and I may not have time to cover all of the science content? Okay. One of the things that I like about anchor text is that you can embed the literacy strategies and still talk about your science concepts. So hopefully when we start talking about how to use a foundational reading activity, I would kind of have given you the answer to that. So we're going into that particular piece right now. And uh, hopefully that toward the, toward, I hope I've answered that particular question on how to embed those literacy strategies in. But before we can do it, we have to make sure we know how to pick the appropriate anchor text. Because you don't, like I said, it's, it deals with time restraint again. So we want to make sure we pick anchor text that have the key vocabulary found in them that we need to address and the key concept as well as increase or keep the student's interest. So that's why I always do a blend of the informational text and also the uh, literacy or science uh, fiction piece. So okay. let's go into, yes. Uh, well, one more question and that is um, our state has as many as 30 different science requirements per grade level. Uh, when we can't cover all of them, how do we decide what the highest priorities are? Okay, so 
you know how you have what are called primary um, standards that usually I, I tell teachers to identify the primary ones. Certain ones of those requirements can be rolled into one standard. Or, or, or for example, let me uh, uh, kind of, in our particular state, before we adopted new standards, I was I worked with eighth grade and I was an eighth grade teacher. We had 72 standards. Hmm. So what we had to do was come up with what are called key standards. Standards that can be rolled into the uh, standards that can roll the other, I call my uh, other standards into one. So let me explain what I mean by that. We're looking at uh, force in motion. It says to apply to use and apply Newton's law. But under that, it talks about force, the use of force, the different types of force, or it talked about speed, velocity. All of those can be rolled into Newton's law. So when I talk about the first, first uh, law of Newton that says that an object is at rest, remains at rest, unless some outside force affects it, I can roll in mass, I can roll in inertia, I can roll in. Uh, those things can be rolled into that. If I look at the second law, I can talk about uh, force equals mass times acceleration. So I can talk about gravity. I can talk about. So you, when you look at those standards, you want to look at uh, look for ways in which you can roll those. I call them my, minor standards into that major one to reduce your amount of time that you're going to spend on those concepts. You don't want to teach each one in isolation. Thank you. I hope I kind of helped with that one. Thank you. OK, so we're looking at science text offer numerous opportunities to expand student vocabulary, which is very important when you're working with at risk, struggling readers, and uh, students in private because they start off with a limited vocabulary from kindergarten. So they're, they're already struggling as they're going through the uh, school feeder grade levels. So it's very important to understand the relationship of vocabulary knowledge and reader achievement. So let's go into, hopefully this will answer the question that keeps coming up about um, teaching literacy and science. How do you use a foundational reading activity that connects to the science and engineering standards. One, they're going to ask questions of each other about the text read. It's going to support the analysis. So when we talk about the analysis, this is when you talk about those literacy, those embedded literacy strategies. And a lot of times I start at the beginning of the year and we create an interactive notebook. And in that interactive notebook, we start emphasizing those embedded literacy strategies like the uh, context clues, uh, questioning stems, those kind of things, because they got to read closely. Remember, you uh, to think like a scientist and an engineer, they use details, they ask questions, uh, they do link cause and effect. So reading closely to determine what the, the text is explicitly saying and to make logical inferences from it, to cite textual evidence when writing and speaking to support conclusions drawn from the text. That's why it's very important to choose anchor text in which students can develop their knowledge to that level and also to include a science fiction piece so they can make those uh, inferences from it. So if I just include only the informational text and not some type of real life or concrete example, they can't make logical inferences from what was being presented. And so we got to, uh, get our instructional level up when it comes to uh, reading, because according to the new standards, we are now also reading teachers and science uh, teachers as well. So when you're reading to explore text and firsthand uh, investigation and discussion, you want to help them. That it, it, it helps the students to inquire the reading strategies even better than just direct instruction. So that's why I said that I worked real closely with my ELA uh, colleagues in a building. And I, I didn't come to realize this until I had 
So uh, I worked with a uh, very heavy ESL population when I was in Dallas, Texas, and about 75% of my students were English as second language learners. And so they really struggled with the uh, reading of the technical and scientific text. I realized that they didn't know what they were reading, then that they could not comprehend or understand the scientific knowledge. So I started working with the ES ESL specialists in the building and the uh, English and the uh, my ELA colleague as well. And we came up with some aligned literacy strategies that were introduced across the board that kind of helped with this particular issue with them when they got to reading in my class, it became almost seamless for them. But it is, it's just like riding a bicycle. When you first learn how to ride a bike, you gotta have training wheels on it. So same with students. They're not gonna get this the first two or three times we introduce it. We must continue to introduce it and continue to introduce it and continue to introduce it. So as we come up with these protocols, we wanna make sure it's a protocol that we understand to use as well as something that they can comprehend uh, throughout the year. So this is one of the ones that I uh, look for when I'm looking at a foundational text. It has to incorporate the thinking skills for comprehension, which we kind of talked about. Thinking like a scientist, remember literacy and science are, have parallel or reciprocal processes. It allows for the dialogue between me and the student and student to student. And it has to be reflective in nature. In other words, they have to reflect about what they've read or what they're doing. Because remember, we're talking about science and engineering practices. What students do is what we're emphasizing when we talk about literacy within the three-dimensional model. So one of the first things that I did was come up with a actual uh, graphic organizer to use. Now, this graphic organizer comes from reciprocal teaching. Reciprocal teaching works with the way it's developed is that it worked with uh, special needs students as well as ESL. They, uh, each student has a role that they do in the group. But I kind of modified mine, so I'm going to talk about what I did. I know that, for example, when I'm dealing with informational text, it, also, it is often um, unfamiliar content that focuses on relationships between the text structures that most students are unprepared to read and understand. So if you notice on question, uh, I wonder if the text will be able to answer. So what in my, in my interactive notebooks that I give students, they have reference pages. One of the reference pages deals with the depth of knowledge question stems. So as they're reading through the text, they actually write down questions that they think is gonna answer the text based on the title. Then as they're reading through the text, they write some more questions and then they look to see if their question could be answered within the article themselves. This is called, this is the inquiry part that you can actually implement when they're reading. And if you notice it says text evidence for a given answer if possible. Then I realized my students were not doing predictions as they should. So the first thing I have them look at is the headings or subheadings or um, any other text features they see. And then they ask, they then make a prediction of what they think that section is about based on keywords. And then if you notice on the side, I have them write down what text feature they use. So as I model and look, we're able then to start looking at what purpose that the, that the uh, author gave for this instructional text. So I have to also, again, I'm talking about the beginning of the year, I kind of front load and start talking to them about what description is, sequence, cause and effect, problem solution, and causative. I also work with the, the social studies teacher in this because the social studies teacher also has a lot of information that she and he has to cover. So both she and I, or whoever I'm partnering with, we begin to work on how we're going to actually facilitate the teaching or modeling of these uh, different structures to our students. The more I model and then provide scaffolding, the students have become more highly uh, successful and the more they're going to learn from uh, the actual reading piece 
which actually frees your time up to cover more scientific uh, information as the year progresses. So that's how I kind of deal with my time. Uh, when we're dealing with reciprocal teaching, it deals with four strategies. You got to clarify, which is the clarifying the key vocabulary, questioning, predicting, and summarizing. Students clarify unknown vocabulary words. They look for those bolded words or even words they don't know, which I'm going to kind of talk about, and they annotate them by using a circle. I'm going to kind of talk about how I teach that in real time, students. They ask questions about the content, which I kind of mentioned about the depths of knowledge. They predict using the text, and then they summarize concisely. I'm going to talk about what I mean by concisely. When they're looking at those headings and subheadings, or even the divisions of paragraphs, I make them re read and then summarize what that paragraph is about. So they do that within the uh, article. Then they choose the ones that are most important for their summarization. So as I do, uh, and then one of the questions that have come up in the past, how do I model these? Well, I model them over a period of four weeks. I den uh, denote about 15 minutes a day because I'm also teaching scientific content now. Usually during this time I'm teaching about the scientific method, those kind of things. And I use the same text. So I take the same text that I've already looked at before. I don't change text because if I change text, it takes time for the brain to process what, they, what the new information. So what I do is I use the same one and I just model it over a period of 15 minutes. So our day is usually 50 minutes each. So I take about 15 minutes to model this particular uh, foundational strategy that I'm gonna use for the rest of the year. Uh, one other thing that I changed with the uh, reading uh, reciprocal teaching, students don't like, one student does not like to read the whole article. So what I've done is that even though this model of users is completed by one, I create a rotation where students take turns and then they annotate the text together. So I model, they read and then they annotate. So why would this work? Well, it encourages them to think about their own processes as they're working through the through this uh, graphic organizer. Um, it keeps them actively involved and monitors their own um, comprehension. And it teaches them to ask questions during reading, which makes it more digestible for them and more comprehended, more, uh, 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 more, it generates more understanding because what they realize is that I have that question, someone else has that question. And then if the question is not answered in the group, then I can address it as a whole class so I can have it in real time context for them. So let me go into, uh, this is just some of the pictures of them actually working on an article. If you notice in the second picture, you'll see the depths of knowledge question stems I was referring to that goes into their interactive notebook. Then you see the full graphic organizer and you also see those sticky notes. She has a pink sticky note. The pink sticky note lets me know they may put down a note on it that they don't understand something. So I may not be exactly at their table. So when I come back to that table, I pick up the pink note or the sticky note, and then I address it for the group. If I feel there's something that uh, I may have seen that particular uh, point on several tables, then I'll stop the class and we call it a stop, stop, listen, learn. And then I actually address the whole class. So. Uh, there, and if you notice on the next one, on the second one, you see the annotation um, guidelines as well. So here in the first picture, the young man in black is the one that's doing the reading. And they are actually just paying attention to what's being read, and then they're going to read it again to annotate, which really helps them because they've seen it twice. Remember uh, when you're doing a closed read, it is repetition. You read with a purpose. So the first time they're just reading, the second time they read for annotation, the third time they may actually look at it for unknown words. So I'm going to stop and reflect again, see if we have any questions or comments. Uh, just a second, Ms. Burden, I'm checking. Um, would you be willing to share your annotation guide? Um, we'll talk about that later toward the end. Um, okay. 
And, and here's a question that I hear all over the place. Have you had any resistance from science teachers seeing themselves as reading teachers? Uh, how do you help them uh, see literacy as an essential part of their instruction? Uh, yes, I have seen um, resistance when it comes to science teachers being reading teachers because we see reading as a separate component instead of seeing reading as part of science. Science depends on reading and writing because to be a good scientist, you have to be a good communicator because you have to share your findings with the world or with your team. So a lot of times I show real life examples where we see the technical writing piece and where we see the scientific applications of what we do as scientists as well as engineering. And, and then I also show the literacy, uh, literacy and science as being parallel processes. And then just uh, a colleague asked, uh, will we have the opportunity to see the slides? Actually, we're going to put the entire presentation, audio and video, so all the slides on the web uh, will have that done by tomorrow. So you'll be able to go to creativeleadership.net and see uh, both audio and video of all these slides. We've only got about 10 minutes left, Ms. Burden, so I'm going to let you charge ahead. Okay. All right. So the next thing is the annotation I was talking about. So if you look at the annotation, you see how she has a question on the side here and you see the question, sir, this is an ESL student, by the way, you see how she has circle kindling and uh, ignite. That lets me know those are words that we have to go back and I have to explain to this child. Also what they do in a group, if there's a word that someone does not know, each group has a different marker and they write down the word on a real, on my, uh, I call it the unknown word wall. So I'm gonna show it to you just right now. Um, then you see the clarification um, piece in the graphic organizer. But if you notice you have the unknown word wall. So if you notice you have seafloor spreading, you have plate, boundary and you have the journey to the center of earth, which dealt with the earth layers so if i look at the seafloor spreading magnet uh magnetized was a word that showed up three times trenches was another word that showed up so as i'm working through the unit i make sure i emphasize real life application words uh and examples of the words they didn't know buoyancy was one that showed up with the uh plate boundary and uh, seismic was a word that showed up when they read the journey to the earth. So this is how I teach the vocabulary in real life context. So this is a real just simple way of finding out what students know, what they don't know, and teaching the actual tier three words that we know come with the unit, but also addressing some words that were also unknown. So I, I mean, actually expanding their vocabulary knowledge, which deals with uh, reading achievement. So I'm going to stop and reflect and kind of share this one with you. When we're dealing with class discussion, reading, and read aloud opportunities, we increase the students' skills in using vocabulary to describe and understand science concepts. And that's why these uh, particular posters are very important to uh, scaffold those scientific reading habits. So the last piece that I want to kind of bring up, and I'm is dealing with text features. So we're dealing with text features. It is the producing a sense of the process of argument for advancing new ideas. We have to analyze the purpose uh, by the explanation of the the process or the discussing it and experiment. Why is that text feature there? A lot of times students don't realize that graphs and data tables are text features or visual features to uh, understand the purpose. So they can kind of get an ask the, to assess the point of view of purpose for why that uh, text was designed or shaped or organized that way. Because lab reports or technical reports are organized in a particular way. Scientific articles are organized in a particular way. And they usually do it around your visual and text features. So if I emphasize to kind of teach those to students, then they're able to understand better what they're reading and comprehend the abstract um, concepts. So kind of let me, uh, I'm kind of talk about the reasons why. Make the information easier to understand. They can kind of infer 
the author's purpose. They clearly support the text, uh, the text uh, context through the chosen features. So if I'm looking at uh, caption, then caption, it gives me an explanation of why the picture is there. Or I'm looking at a legend on a map, that's a text feature. That legend there is to help me with symbols found on the map. But if I don't explicitly teach that to students, then they don't realize why those text features are there. It also helps the struggling reader to identify what really is important in that scientific uh, content for that particular section. So let me give you an example. So if you notice I have the text uh, the, the task is you're going to read two uh, descriptions of the Earth's interior structure and summarize what you notice about similarities and differences. So I kind of emphasize what I'm looking for for this. Then I've given them some guiding questions that they can kind of build upon. But at the bottom, if you notice, you have two distinctly different type of, you have a picture and a caption. The one comes from the university, I'm sorry, the uh, U United States Geological Society, which is an excellent place to get articles. Another one comes from Iris, which is another place, good place to get articles from. But you have to scaffold them because some of them are, like, you know, are, can be some difficulty for students, or you just might want to chunk some different pieces out of it. And I haven't read the whole article, which I do a lot of times. So this has been chunked out, and one deals with just talking about the layers, and one deals with the uh, P and S waves when you deal with earthquakes and exploring it through seismology, which I know the students have trouble with seismic waves. So this is one of the ones I made sure that I broke down the word into its Greek and Latin parts for them, because they showed me on the unknown word map that seismic was a, was a trouble vocabulary word for them. Also, this was a, t uh, these two are, is a compare and contrast. So I used the compare and contrast graphic organizer to show comparisons for them for similarities and differences. I also made sure I emphasized the scientific knowledge. So this is how you start cutting down the time on scientific knowledge, you're still teaching the science, but you're also teaching the embedded literary, uh, literary strategy for them as well. Again, they learn when they have a reason why than just them being isolated. So what were some of the key points and takeaways that you've gotten so far from connecting literacy to scientific instruction? Uh, just one more question, Ms. Burden, and that is, what's the most appropriate way to develop vocabulary? Um, one of the ones is that they need to use them as they do science. For example, instead of having a traditional word wall, they need to have an uh, interactive model wall where scientific models are annotated with the proper vocabulary, similar to what you uh, saw in this particular uh, slide here. Also, they need to connect the terms to previous uh, learning and also using uh, videos and media resources as well. Um, another one is looking at using uh, tier two scientific vocabulary, such as terms of, of evidence, um, analyze, predict, uh, environment. These academic words have unique applications in science and should be taught along with the tier three so that you don't have that, the, the um, I call it double meaning interfering with your tier three vocabulary. A lot of times like mass and weight, it took me a minute as a uh, beginning teacher to realize that weight and mass are used interchangeably in everyday society, but in science, they, are, they, have, two dis they have two distinct meanings. There are well, a lot of yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Burton, go ahead. Then another thing is um, having different text uh, uh, options, such as journals and, and um, trade books, online resources and fun science books. 
I have a reading um, station, I have a listening station, and I have a computer station. Uh, there is very small in my room, but I have enough where if they need to get in uh, more information, they're able to do so. And then another thing too, uh, monitoring, uh, monitoring those communications on students and making sure they emphasize when they talk to each other and write that they're using those new terms and giving them that guided practice to reflect and chunk those meanings really helps with the vocabulary pieces. Well, I just want to thank you so much for uh, this teacher perspective. You, you take a lot of theory and you, you show that you walk the walk and you really give us an insight into what it's like in the real world of the classroom science teacher. Uh, I know that we'll make this available to you, uh, to all of our participants and to people who were not able to appear today. And uh, Ms. Burden will also be available as I will if you'd like to have some follow-up conference calls and, uh, and video conferences so that if you'd like to have some of these ideas applied in your school and in your classrooms, uh, we'll be able to help you do just that. Um, I just wanna thank you, Leslie. Uh, you've been uh, so thoughtful and analytical and really illustrated uh, some great ideas here. I see that you have up on the slide uh, how people can get more information. Uh, we'll put this, uh, this webinar up at creativeleadership.net in just a few hours or at the latest tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm Doug Reeves. Thank you all for joining us so much. Uh, you've been incredibly helpful, and uh, we really appreciate your uh, widespread participation. Have a great rest of the day.